Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to the plenary session in law at the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotlawala Defence University. This year's conference is held under the theme of security, stability and the national development in the new normal. The plenary session in law is conducted under the sub-theme challenges faced by the Sri Lankan legal system in the context of the new normal. To mark the beginning of this occasion, please rise for the Kadio song. Thank you. You may take your seats. It is expected that this session will provide the platform to a wide range of discussion on the diverse fields of law and their operation in the context of the new normal. The session is chaired by His Lordship Chief Justice Jayanta Jayasurya, President's Council. The esteemed panel of speakers of this session include Honorable Muhammad Ali Sabri, President's Counsel, Minister of Justice. Honorable Susil Premajantha, State Minister of Education Reforms, Open Universities and Distant Learning Promotion. Ms. Farzana Jamil, President's Counsel, Senior Additional Solicitor General. Dr. Joe Silva, former Principal of Sri Lanka Law College. Honorable Mohan Piris, President's Counsel, former Chief Justice and the permanent representative to the United Nations. Dear Madam and Sirs, we are extremely honored by your presence here at this session today. Now, I respectfully invite the reporter of the session in law to introduce the honorable chairperson of the session. His Lordship, 
Jain Jai Surya, President's Council, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Honorable Muhammad Ali Sabri, President's Council, Minister of Justice, Honorable Susil Prema Jayanth, Minister, State Minister of Education, Honorable Sanjay Rai Ratnam, President's Council, Attorney General, Honorable Mohan Piris, President's Council, former Chief Justice and Permanent Representative of Sri Lanka to the United Nations, Mrs. Farsana Jamil, President's Council, Senior Additional Solicitor General, Dr. Joe Silva, former Principal, Sri Lanka Law College, Major General Melinda Piris, Vice Chancellor, General Sejon Kotarala Defense University, officers, staff, and students of the General Sajon Kutla Defense University. Good afternoon. We are about to witness the plenary session on law in the 14th International Research Conference of KDU held under the theme, Challenges Faced by the Sri Lankan Legal System in the Context of New Normal. Under the prevalent circumstances, it, is, we, it has been held virtually, although we plan to hold it on site. I am thankful to His Lordship, the Chief Justice, for accepting the invitation to chair this session also for the third time. His Lordship chaired the session in 2016 as the then Attorney General for the first time, and last year also as the Chief Justice for the second time. His Lordship, President's Council Jayanth Jasurye, received his education at Maliadev College, Purnagala. Thereafter, he entered the Sri Lanka Law College and was admitted to the bar in 1982. He obtained a Master of Philosophy from the University of Hong Kong on the Commonwealth Scholarship in 1992. He joined the Attorney General's Department in 1983 as a state council and was promoted steadily and, then, and ended up becoming the Attorney General in 2016. Meanwhile, His Lordship was sworn in as the President's Council in 2012 and he is also a solicitor in England and Wales. During his long career at the Aegis Department, he functioned as the head of the criminal division and also assisted the Presidential Commission of Inquiry in relation to the activities of non-governmental organizations and the and Special Presidential Commission's Commission of Inquiry in relation to the malpractices and corruption in the state institutions. He also functioned as a legal consultant for the Financial Intelligence Unit of the Central Bank. He also worked for the United Nations as a trial attorney in two war crimes tribunals and was awarded the Prosecutor of the Year in 2012 by the International Association of Prosecutors. He was appointed as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka in April 2019. I now cordially invite His Lordship, the Chief Justice, to commence the plenary session in law with his preliminary remarks. Over to you, sir. All today, the array of speakers we have that I would like to introduce them in a while, and also the participants that who are so keen in joining with this great event and see how far and to what extent that we had to change ourselves in adapting ourselves to the new normal. So we, it's, it's a term that we had come to uh, be with us, maybe about a, from a, a time of about a year or so. And we all are trying to see how far and how best that we could be with the new normal when we compare to what we were before prior to 2020. 
and uh, without much ado we i would like to invite the first speaker of this session the plenary session on law he he needs no uh, introduction but still i think as a formality that i have the duty to introduce the current minister of justice of sri lanka who had been in the legal profession for about uh, two and a half decades and of that since 2012 as a president's counsel he had been a active practitioner until upon the time that he was appointed he became a member of parliament and then he was appointed the minister of justice and in addition to being in the legal field that he had been also uh, the sri lankan consul general in jeddah saudi arabia and also he represented sri lanka in the united nations human rights council in the year 2012 so the experience that he has as an active practitioner and the other engagements that he had had so far with the responsibilities that he is carrying on his shoulder as the honorable minister of justice so he would address us on sustaining judicial power of the people throughout the pandemic and uh, we would i i i would not want to uh, make any observations or comments in this regard though i think it's the best is to hear from he himself that who had been in the forefront working hard to ensure that the justice system would continue in the same way or perhaps in the better way in the context of the present situation so may i hand over the floor to you honorable minister honorable mohammed ali sabri president's council be unmute the lordship the chief justice of sri lanka mr jayanta jay surya president's council honorable deputy minister of education honorable uh, state minister of education mr susil prem jayanta honorable attorney general additional solicitor general distinguished guest and distinguished colleagues first of all let me congratulate and thank the kdu for organizing or at least not suspending the yet uh, going ahead with your yearly plenary session that itself is the new normal i think new normal need not need no further introduction than the manner in which you are holding today's uh, conference itself you could have easily found an excuse the excuse would have been a uh, pandemic they locked down we can't do it and let's forget about it and go to the next year but you thought otherwise despite all these difficulties you will find a way and you got you convinced everyone else and you managed to get an, get all of them on board in order to get it going so when it comes to the judicial power of the people this is inalienable there are three powers we all know executive legislature and the judicial power judicial power is not that government gives to somebody or opposition imposes on someone else no it is people's right right in terms of the constitution so everyone who has taken an oath to uphold the constitution of our country has a duty obligation to see that power is used despite any obstacles i'm thankful despite the difficulties and the challenges government had continued to 
made representation to open the courthouses, at least for urgent matters, even during the height of Delta variant, this attack which we are undergoing right now. And I'm thankful the judiciary, Judicial Service Commission led by His Lordship, the Chief Justice, and the Attorney General, uh, Honorable Attorney General and his department, uh, giving all the support and encouragement to see that it happens because freedom of people, liberty of the subject is of paramount importance. Everything else can take uh, wait a bit, but not the people's right, not the people's right for freedom, freedom of movement and liberty. If that is being challenged, we have to find a way to uh, provide that services. It is in that context that so many countries all over the world had innovated various ways and means in terms of which during these difficult times they have found a way to see that the judicial functions have contributed. For example, in India, our neighboring country, the Supreme Court, the High Court and the District Court from March last year have been continuously functioning, including the trials online. And I know from next Monday, they are going for a hybrid system. Hybrid system in terms of which uh, whoever who wants to personally come and present, the, they will be given a preference 24 hours uh, in advance and others can continue to work on uh, online. So in that sense, this is a challenge. And I also see this is an opportunity if we use it as a catalyst for future development and transformation. If you look at some of the areas which is less uh, privileged or less uh, uh, technically savvy, all of them have approved us. None of us now go to, uh, the most of us don't go to the, uh, the um, uh, uh, supermarket and buy. You just order and they will deliver. I know a vast majority of our farmers get into a particular app. I don't want to mention the name of the app. And they sell their produce and people buy their produce, including mangoes to wattaka. People have gone to that level. So if you look at it, unfortunately, whatever we do, this is going to be there for some time. At the beginning of the pandemic, we thought Several countries did very well, including Sri Lanka, the first wave. And up to this March or so, Kerala in India and Vietnam in forefront of it. But during the uh, last two to three months, both Kerala and Vietnam is suffering massively due to this, just like us. We all thought Australia and uh, New Zealand with their massive land mass and limited population and a hefty budget and savings could get over this because they had this contract, contact uh, uh, tracing and locking it down. Now they are also rethinking that zero, inf uh, zero infection is no longer possible. So if you look at in Sri Lanka, we played the cricket match last few days with no spectators. But I'm sure most of you all would have also seen famous cricket matches are going on in India and England. That's in London. Everyone without masks, packed houses. That is because they have adopted it. They have vaccinated themselves, follow the protocol, and take that minimum amount of risk. Otherwise, we will have to close everything down and wait. Yesterday, would, if anybody followed the uh, news, you would have seen the finance minister announced the loss of uh, the, 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 the loss to the economy due to the lockdown. Just three weeks of lockdown, the losses amount into about 1,800 billion. So this cannot go on. 
so we need to find a way as to how we can move, we move on it is in that context i think there is no exception when it comes to the uh, uh, the the uh, judiciary and the people's power to go to courts and fight for their rights which is not uh, so anybody is giving as i said this is their right so we need to ensure that right is being properly exercised and given a platform for them to do that it is in that context that from the beginning we in discussion with the bar association of sri lanka with the jsc with the honorable attorney general had uh, rolled out several programs first we kept court open recently it was uh, the court was not mentioned but i must admire and acknowledge his lordship chief justice personally in intervened and said that no court also have to function by that time i also have spoken that is the commitment we have that this should function similarly honorable attorney general on few occasion when we had a massive uh, numbers in the uh, in the prisons and there was an outbreak came out with very innovative suggestions innovative solutions to meet those thirdly when we went through a, a prolonged period of lockdown we managed to provide whatever the services so requirement wanted by the jsc in the supreme court in the court of appeal in other courts wherever they were wanted we provided them the laptops to the other equipment in order to have e hearing and luckily our judges had been uh, proactive in that at least for the uh, cases involved in liberty of the people bail applications and things like that so there were there are so many other areas similar to that urgent cases where somebody's uh, property is going to be option because uh, some people can be unconscious uh, even during the uh, pandemic somebody so you have no other place to go other than to go to exert uh, assert your right so that has to be open for urgent matters liberty cannot be uh, we can say as one or two person but for that person liberty is more important than anything else so we have to ensure that happen there are maintenance cases that goes to the root of their existence there are domestic violence cases there are cases child abuse and uh, child safety so we have no choice rather than adapt into new normal just like the schools and the tuitions and the businesses have adopted this is a good opportunity for us to adapt, adapt. and therefore i think we must make use of this as an opportunity to move forward as far as the from the ministry side we have continued to engage with all the stakeholders both official and unofficial bar with the concurrence and support and the approval of the jsc to roll out a program wherever it is necessary so we hope this will go to the next level we are in the process uh, in order to uh, provide that the our digitalization committee was in con constant touch with the um, judicial service commission and we have come out with the uh e rules permitting for e hearing we have gone one step further uh, further and we have promulgated the covid 19 act which allow e hearing and we have connected the court of appeal with the most of the prisons in the country so that appeals could continue to go on when the situation returns to a little better without their presence they can watch what the proceedings we can provide this because we can afford one or two years of total closure on top of the massive pressure on the judiciary itself we have about 800000 cases to be determined by 350 judges so it's a massive massive challenge so blessing in disguise i see in this is to adopt the technology 
I was chairing a law ministers conference of the Commonwealth countries. There were about 50 countries which took part in that. It was uh, very refreshing to hear small countries like Bahamas to um, from Bangladesh, from Canada, different uh, uh, countries around the globe who comes under and forms the, uh, the Commonwealth. The innovative new ways they have adopted, particularly using technology. It is basically on e-hearing, e-hearing, e, um, e-argument, documentations, e-filing, uh, e-issue of proceedings. They have gone a, a long way. So I'm sure we are in the process of rolling out the uh, digitalization process. We signed a, a four-party agreement with ICTA, JSC, Ministry, and the ENY. Uh, uh, in, consult in order to roll out the digitalization process. Probably from January, we can roll that out at the first, first instant, 42 courts houses. That is for the comprehensive solution. So what I feel and what I see is uh, we must make use of this as an opportunity to immediately go to that step we couldn't go. Luckily, now the customs fully automated Everything takes place in the customs uh, through uh, online uh, applications, online clearance, online submissions. So it's possible. Uh, we need to find a way to do that. But some areas, for example, in the uh, some of the government institution where proceedings are there, proceedings are issued. You can only make an application on uh, online. You still have to go there, take a printout, pay the money, and one, one week later they pay. So it's it, it, that's not working. So we need to find a way if that is there. You have to have a payment gate also. You should be able to pay online. You should be able, uh, they should be able to charge that online. And on uh, they should be able to email that document. Otherwise, it's not uh, digitalization. It's a... Uh, it's, uh, um, Actually, I don't know what, it's a hybrid kind of a thing. So therefore, it's important that we move on with it. So basically, I won't take much any longer than this. It is time for us. Um, I invite uh, KD also to do a research paper and, paper and submit to us as to how we can do it better. Uh, now, England had uh, night courts during the uh, during, uh, pandemic for urgent cases. We are uh, e-hearings were permitted. Some places they do have a uh, hybrid system, half uh, online and half uh, physical hearing. So I think for us to sustain this me method, we should invoke this technology and e-hearing and e-filing, and we must continue to have this even after normalcy returns. Then only we can sustain and slowly transfer to that. Otherwise, what happens is we come with all these things, we do it for a month or so, then we come back to normal and totally go unblocked to uh, physical. Uh, then something goes back. Uh, no one understands again, you have to st start it uh, from all over again from the scratch. So, therefore, uh, my uh, submission would be, uh, my presentation would be. Uh, Whatever the circumstances could be, whatever the difficulty we may have, court has to function. It is our duty to see that court's function as stakeholders. In getting the court to function, we need to adapt and use a little bit of common sense like what we have done with the Honorable Attorney General's advice and the JSC's concurrence regarding bailing provisions in these uh, trying times and then adopt technology and go on to the next level so that it will ultimately be a blessing in disguise that this came, we adopted this technology and it ultimately speeded up our path to uh, a more efficient and efficacious judiciary. I, can, I always say, and I can say without any hesitation, our judiciary by far 
and uh, independence is is not an issue. They have always stood by. They have all one or two cases here and there. Some people can suggest, but we have always been a very strong independent judiciary. We are proud of our judiciary. We are proud of our judges. But because of the sheer scale of work and the outdated laws and the uh, less than uh, ideal work environment and the facilities, we cannot say the same about the efficacy and efficiency. So I think this could be a, a catalyst for us to move on towards that direction. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And I wish the conference and the KDU all the very best. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thank you, sir. For taking all of us through the different steps that we had taken so far in the judicial field. And also, it is important, as you said at the beginning, not to go with the excuses, but to find a way out. I think that's very important for everyone in every field to ensure that we would take the challenge and then ensure that we find a way out to discharge our duties, which is the prime concern of everyone. And also you took us through the examples from the other jurisdictions and then the lessons that we can learn from the other jurisdictions, which is also very important because we are not working isolation we are not in isolation. There are so many things that we can learn from other countries. And also we can improve our system and just to ensure that ultimately what we provide to the society is the best that we can provide in the context of administration of justice mechanism. So as you said, it's not only the availability of the technology, but the commitment of all stakeholders play a key role in meeting these challenges. So thank you again, Honorable Minister, for taking us through with this process. And the next speaker whom I have to invite is also not, uh, is also very familiar to the legal field, who had been in the legal field before he took over other responsibilities in the government several years ago. And from the time that he had taken over responsibilities and in the discharge of his public duties, he had been in charge of several portfolios, Minister of Education, Minister of Power and Energy, Petroleum Industry, environment and renewable energy, technology and research. And currently he is holding the state ministership of education reforms, open universities and distance learning promotion. So the vast experience that you have in all these areas obviously would be giving you a very good opportunity to ensure that what we are experiencing today is not a challenge that we cannot take upon or that we cannot meet successfully. And Honorable Susil Premajan would address us on the system of public administration in the new normal environment. In fact, it is interesting to observe that he had experience and he had gathered knowledge in public administration by obtaining a master's degree from the University of Sri Javadhanapura. And I'm sure with all these background and the experience and the exposure that you had to in all these fields that you would provide a very valuable discourse to all the participants on how the administration would work in this new normal. May I invite Mr. Honorable Susil Premajan, State Minister for Education.
Your Lordship, Jayanti Jaya Surya, President, Council and the Chief Justice of Sri Lanka, Honorable Mohammed Anishabri, President's Council and Minister of Justice, Honorable Mohan Piris, former Chief Justice and permanent representative to the United Nations, Honorable Attorney General Rajaratnam, President's Council, the Vice Chancellor of the KDU, Dr. Joe Silva, former Principal of Law College, Senior Additional Solicitor General, respected academics, guest speakers, professionals, administrators, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I must thank your Lordship, Chief Justice, and the Jesuit President's Council for the introduction today on me. Uh, let me congratulate the academics and administrators of KDU for their high performance at the university and for organizing this very useful and timely conference on challenges faced by the Sri Lankan legal system in the context of new normal. I thought of uh, make my presentation uh, on uh, the challenges faced by the Sri Lanka legal system in the context of new normal as well as the public administration because uh, the uh, justice and the public administration, these two subjects, there are so many uh, correlation situations that we are experiencing. Uh, with my experience as a politician for more than 21 years in parliament, uh, holding different portfolios, and uh, during that period, especially as Minister of Science and Technology, I have attended so many research symposiums organized by different faculties of our universities. With that experience, I believe most of the research of our researchers uh, based on fundamentals. Very hardly you find research based on applied Therefore, first of all, I take this opportunity to focus the attention of the university authorities, academics and professionals to guide our younger generation to engage with research, especially on applied research. Because at this stage, we need uh, our young graduates or postgraduates engage with applied research and come out with uh, very good proposals, especially in the new normal situation. Uh, it is my personal view, and I saw some articles appeared in newspapers and the internet. Uh, one of the United Nations spokesmen have told, has told uh, the mostly affected SDG goals are goal number one, poverty elevation, and goal number four, quality education, out of 17 SDG goals. So I am engaged with number four, the quality education. So let me uh, speak few minutes about the education that we are facing today. The, uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic situation. Here in our, our country, we have more than 10,165 pro uh, provincial and national schools in our country. Over 85 private schools and over 392 international schools, over 800 Pirivena, and there are 25 schools for special education. In this whole system, you find 4.3 million student population with 250,000 uh, teachers, 13,000 principals, 
and uh, administrators over 4,000. So in this system of schools, especially the general education from uh, preschool stage, grade one to 13, is, uh, we call general education. This is the most affected uh, uh, area uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic situation. For example, uh, in the year two, 2020, after 19th of March, 2020, all schools closed down by the government and we had only 65 school days out of 210. But we managed to hold uh, grade five scholarship examination, O-level examination and the A-level examinations. 2021, except Western province, all other eight province schools are open from 3rd of January until the single new year. But Western province, all the schools were closed and they had only five days school, five school days so far. So it's a big challenge for us, but we are using distance modes, the FM channels and uh, television channels. We have five television channels, four dialogues and one Rupahani. Uh, by using that, we telecast over 7,000 contents from grade one to 13 in single medium, Tamil medium, and even in English medium. So I just want to uh, tell all of you that with all these challenges, we try to keep alive the education system in our country. Otherwise, of course, we think if we continue close down all the schools and without any kind of education to our uh, younger generation. So we don't know where we end up. But the government and the ministry is trying their level best to educate our children through online televisions and FM. So now I like to speak about uh, the, the challenges that we are facing today, especially in the uh, legal system. I wish to share some of my ideas about one of the serious challenges that we all in Sri Lanka are facing today on challenges faced by the Sri Lankan legal system in the context of new norm. Before I assumed duties as the state minister, a few months I was practicing in Hulstock in criminal courts uh, after many years. But however, I found over 20,000 legal practitioners in all over the places in the country. So they're also facing hardships. I know personally that especially the young uh, practitioners uh, facing uh, so many challenges to engage with their practice, day-to-day -day practice. Uh, due to the close down of uh, courts and uh, due to unavoid unavoidable circumstances, the postponing the cases. So uh, they are responsible for their litigants. Uh, not only that, of course, they are losing uh, their earnings day-to-day. -day. That is my personal experience. Uh, in Hulstops. I know uh, Honorable Minister of Justice, he knows very well as a practitioner. The challenge is how to ensure that our legal system and public administration are driving forward in order to provide leadership in solving problems in the new normal environment treated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me first describe the nature of the new normal environment as I see it. The COVID-19 affected environment of our economy must be understood in terms of the immediate 
or the operating environment and the macro for the global environment. Honorable Minister of Finance, two days ago in Parliament, explained so what is our economic situation in the country due to COVID-19 pandemic situation. We have lost all our local revenues except exports. We have lost the custom duty, excise duties, wet, income tax. So we lost, as Honorable Minister said, 4,600 billions in this year. To maintain the public service, including the judiciary, we need over 1,900 billions for every year, apart from other capital expenditure. But however, it is a responsibility and government discharge the duties to maintain the normal lifestyle of the people in our country. Uh, so I, I have to, I must highlight a few things, especially in the field of uh, legal system. Uh, the challenge that the legal system has to face today is, let remind you, that our legal system is well structured as stipulated in the Constitution and the Judicature Act. But I suggest our uh, Minister of Justice is here with us and he is seated next to me in Parliament. So uh, I have to point out some of the other, some of the important issues and demands the new paradigm of work that is evolving fast, including the following. Maintain law and order in the country is a challenging task. Delivering justice to aggrieved parties. Using our technology, Zoom and Skype technology. Bail procedures in criminal cases. Conducting trials at original courts. Delivering judgments without delay. But I take this opportunity to thank His Lordship the Chief Justice, the Judicial Services Commission, AGIS Department for taking appropriate action to keep live the legal system in the country with the assistance of the Minister of Justice in this turbulence atmosphere. Our future is not an easy extension of the past anymore. We have to think of a new future that departs from the past ways of seeing problems and past ways of finding solutions. We must work towards the legal system of Sri Lanka, which is driven by the Constitution and the Judicature Act and related laws and rules. But I suggest we need some limited amendments to civil procedure, criminal procedure, related laws and rules to keep live the legal system in our country with the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic. In Sri Lanka, we have a well-structured administrative system. We have nine provinces, 25 administrative districts, 335 division secretariats, 14,025 grams of This is an uh, hierarchical pyramid shape structure inherited from British rule, but there are a lot of amendments introduced, especially after the 30th Amendment to the Constitution. As a result of the 30th Amendment, we have nine provinces. Within these nine provinces, we have 25 administrative divisions and I, as I explained, division secretaries, grams of division. In those levels, of course, you find so many institutions, government institutions. For an example, for each and every provincial council, we have a governor, the chief executive, and the chief secretary, and five uh, minister secretaries, and the provincial office, zonal office, divisional office, and uh, officials, thousands of officials assigned duties uh, respectively. So we can use this structure. Similarly, we have in the field of health sector, we have uh, provincial head, uh, deputy director generals, an MOH office, PHI, 
their midwives. So similarly, in the field of education, we have nine provincial offices, 99 zonal office divisions, and then the school system. So we can use all these structures to decentralize the, the implementation of the policies and the decisions taken by the center. So similarly, we can apply the same pattern or same system to the judiciary system. So therefore, I suggest uh, Honorable Minister of Justice and your Lordship the Chief Justice and the all the participants uh, in this uh, research conference uh, think about how to apply the existing structures and human resource as well as physical resource with uh, limited uh, fund allocation to overcome the challenges that we are facing in the field of legal system as well as administrative system. So we have to live with this pandemic as most of the scientists and doctors, that is, they are of the view that at least for next three years, we have to, we have to control this and at the same time, we have to with, live with this. So if that is, that is the situation, so we have to change our attitudes and we have to adapt to the new normal situation, not only in other fields, but in legal system and the public administrative system. For this purpose, the law faculties in our university system should encourage law students to engage with applied research with the guidance of university academics and professionals. So in that means, this research conference is very important. And with all these challenges, I, they managed to organize this very important uh, research conference with the participation of very eminent personalities today. So once again, I thank the Vice Chancellor of the KDU and the faculty academics for inviting me for this very important session today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for that discourse with your experience and the exposure in all these different areas. You managed to identify the salient features where we need to address and then consider how best that we could use the existing structures, which are based on very solid ground. But with the necessary changes and amendments to ensure that all those strong structures that we had been enjoying all this far will be best put to best use in these challenging times. So you took us through the impact it has on different areas, important areas, including one of the most important sustainable development goals, the quality education and the impact it has on this and the challenges that we are faced with. Not only that, the legal structure and the administrative mechanisms that are in our country, how best that we can use the existing structures to meet in these challenges. So thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for that discourse. Thank now, you. For the, as the next speaker to, Take us through the legal reforms and the functioning of courts in the era of new normal. I would like to invite the next speaker that who has immense experience and exposure in the legal field, that who had joined at the beginning of her career as a state counsel in the Attorney General's department, and now had come up to the position of a senior additional solicitor general. And also that who is a president's counsel, that who is the, who has had many experience and exposure in academic arena as well. Now she is an, a graduate from the 
Colombo University, Sri Lanka, the law faculty, and hold of two master's degrees, one from the University of Colombo and the other from University College London, where she obtained the master's of law degree with merit. So the experience that she has on administrative law, international trade law, international environment law, and international law on natural resources has given her enough and sufficient exposure and experience. Along with the professional experience that she had gained serving the Attorney General's department all this time, I'm sure that she would be in a position to address this August Assembly on the challenges that is faced by the legal sector and what options are available to ensure that the functioning of courts is not disrupted. So the experience that she has in the Republic of Fiji as a visiting judge of the Court of Appeal would certainly be of immense help to identify new practices, new procedures, where the efficiency of our systems can be enhanced tremendously. So may I invite Ms. Varsana Jamil, President's Council, Senior Additional Solicitor General to address this gathering. Okay, good afternoon. My Lord, the Chief Justice, Jan Mr. Jayanti Jayasuriya, President's Council, the Honorable Minister of Justice, Mr. Emir Ali Sabri, President's Council, Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Sanjay, Sanjay Raja Ratnam, President's Council, Honorable Minister, Mr. Susil Premajayan, President's Council, Mr. Mohan Piris, uh, President's Council, former Chief Justice of Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka's present representative to the UN, permanent representative to the UN, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the KDU, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Law of the KDU, Dr. Mangala Vijay Singha, all participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to say a few words on the topic given to me, and I've been asked to speak on uh, challenges faced by the legal, by the justice system in Sri Lanka under the new norm. We have now gotten used to this phrase, new normal. It is being spoken of all the time. And I would like to match it up with what I would call the new possible. So if we just go back a bit, in the middle of March 2020, court buildings around the world began to close. And in response to the rapid spread of the newly identified coronavirus, within days, an alternative way of delivering justice or a court service were put in place in many jurisdictions. Many countries immediately enacted legislation. So in Singapore, they enacted it in the early part of 2020 itself, upon the heels of the virus taking over. The uptake of the various technologies, it appears, has accelerated justice systems in numerous countries. And when we look back now, we find that most countries that have adapted best to the crisis with regard to the judicial system and the service that it provides, are countries that already had in place an electronic or e-court system ongoing. So the current crisis that has been triggered is not only a health crisis, as we can see, and we heard the ministers talk about, but it is a socio-economic one, which poses serious threats to our lives, but at the same time opens up opportunities for us to seize and meet the challenge with technology and a change of mindset helping us to go down that route. And I would think that in the 10 minutes or 12 minutes that I've been given to speak about, I think I need to break this down into a couple of points, and that is the public health and safety aspect, uh, the disposal of justice, which seems to be the the main aim of this whole program, which then leads us to the allocation of judicial resources and infrastructure related to the, related to the judicial system, 
the prioritizing of those resources for us to decide, for the courts to decide how to triage cases, then also I think one needs to look at the, the difference between digitization and transformation. Digitization doesn't necessarily mean transforming the legal system, which is what I think will eventually happen as a result of this crisis. And during that period, during this period, we will have to be conscious of the existing backlog of cases that was there in place before the crisis came upon us. And the continuation of the backlog, backlog during the time that time stood still, as well as COVID triggered litigation. And the movement away, I think this whole the entire crisis will have to be looked at and the solution will have to be looked at from moving away from the traditional court system and courthouse system to a new norm, which becomes then the new possible. But for that to happen, we need to completely change our mindsets. And in that process, I think what we will be looking at and what will trigger the change is the role of technology, which the, the speakers and His Lordship, the Chief Justice have already adverted to, the role of technology, the acceptance of the new norms, and the result of those consequences. In looking at this topic, I am most fascinated, and I think the world over, many countries have looked at this system. Professor Richard Suskin, who's head of law and technology center, and is the technology advisor to the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. He calls himself a legal futurist, and I think that is correct. In his book, The Online Courts and the Future of Justice, sees the pandemic as a stepping stone to changing how the world looks at the justice system. And this is just exactly what our justice minister told us when he started speaking. So until a few weeks ago or a couple of months ago, it would have been unthinkable for any of us to believe that non-physical courts and remote hearings could be regarded as a, as a fair system or as complying with rule of law requirements. But the cultural barriers that we have built for ourselves is such that it, it will need a whole change of mindset for us to accept that one does not need to be inside the courthouse for justice to be dispensed. And so, but in the middle of all of that, the virus came, the courts closed, and it took only a fortnight for many can't did not be sitting there in a courthouse to dispense justice. So the fundamental question that will arise from this whole, from the, from the aftermath of the crisis is, is justice, uh, is it a service? Is the delivery of justice a service or is it a place? Can justice be given and dispensed with only if it is in a particular place? So whilst we are all used to the grandeur of the courthouse, the question will arise, how should governments prepare for the future? What should these frameworks be like? So the paramount, in, the paramount consideration at the time of the, the crisis descending upon us was the health and safety of the public. Economics and everything else took a back seat. But policymakers now know that they have to make trade-offs among competing values in the pandemic. And sometimes, Things that we saw, thought were important before will have to go to the back burner while more important things are taken into the, into the forefront. Now, COVID-19, as we know, forces us to rethink government, all types of governance, as the minister himself spoke about with regard to the two areas he covered, uh, the, special, the sustainable development goals, and the minister looked at education in particular. But, it is clear that whilst we are experiencing this huge disruption in all economic and social activities, we are all perceiving differently how business is to be done and how services are to be delivered in the future. Now, one aspect is the digital transformation and the electronic filing of documents. So that is something that people have gotten used to and our legal system also, with the help of the Justice and the Minister of Justice and the legal reforms that we are on, 
has taken us into a digitization process. Yes. But having said that, the question is, how far and how much can we do to ensure that the dispensation of justice is not interrupted in a way that affects the quality of justice that is dispensed? So the question then is, is justice a place or a service? And the answer to that will lie in this. Do we really need to gather in one place in a particular building to settle our legal disputes? And in the United Kingdom last year, uh, the UK on 21st of March 2020, the Supreme Court decided its first case digitally, Fowler versus Commissioners of Income Tax, online. The whole case, everything was done online. And now the question is, are we, we are looking to digital tools to make access to justice possible during the pandemic. But whilst we are doing that, I think we are all required to be conscious of the fact that there is a digital divide and not everybody has, not everybody has access or equal access to electronic resources. So what the UK did was, they set up what they called Nightingale courts in different, different locations and they continued the work to go on. They allowed the work to go on. But however, they had to be mindful of, again, the public safety, the safety of witnesses, the safety of the judges, all of that had to be gone into. And in some cases, some courts, they had a hybrid system where half of the judges would sit in one courthouse and half in, in their chambers, and the case was heard. So even the judges did not gather together. Now, the challenges are twofold as I see it, my lord, as I see it, is that it presents a challenge to manage the physical infrastructure and the resources. And so you're managing physical space, the availability of courtrooms. At the same time, whilst that is going on, simultaneously, one has to manage the prioritization of cases. How do you triage cases and set criteria for priority. What is it that just cannot be ignored and what, what is it that can be given a second place? So defining and refining and setting criteria for what is critical, urgent and necessary is, is going to be a challenge. Immediately mobilizing new processors is going to be a challenge. Giving access to courthouses and training of staff and changing the mindsets of the lawyers and the litigants is going to be a challenge. Is a litigant going to be happy allowing his counsel to work from home and be the only person who has access to the court and the judge and him not be part of the hearing process? Relaxing deadlines and processes is one challenge. So many countries already have done that by moving the timelines, the prescription timelines. But then the question also will arise, how fair is that? Does somebody, is somebody who should, who should not be getting the benefit of an extended timeline being given a timeline extension unjustifiably to the detriment of another party? How do you deal with trial courts versus appellate courts? In my humble opinion, appellate courts will have less of a problem than trial courts. The, the question, answering the question of whether the distribution of justice and the giving of justice is a, is justice a place or is justice a service will depend on how one is able to give access to justice. And what is meant by access to justice is not simply in my mind filing a case in court and having it called and take, being taken up on time. But also, what is the nature of the court, uh, the court presentation? What is the nature of what goes on? How much of the argument has been heard? What is the nature of participation of the litigant? So is it open justice? Is it a fair decision? Meaning, is there substantive justice? Is there procedural justice? Is there a fair process follow? Is it transparent? Do the litigants know what's going on? Is it accessible? Is, there been, is it proportionate? And uh, is it sustainable? Do we have the resources to go and present this system right through? 
So that is a challenge that we will be definitely faced with. It is not purely the filing of the document electronically that will solve the problem for us. It will also be what type of hearing are we going to be satisfied with? Are we going to be satisfied with a total paper hearing where every single document, every single argument is filed by paper and judges decide also by paper, parties don't see each other, which is one style, one that the world is looking at, other countries are looking at. Secondly, a hybrid system where part of it is heard in person and part of it is heard on paper. So how much of staff can be there? For how long can they be there? So those are the two challenges with regard to infrastructure, resource allocation, and the more challenging one will be the triaging of cases. Who will decide what case is important? What is the criteria that the court is going to use when it is going to accept a case as being urgent? The, apart from managing the medical infrastructure, I think there will also be come a time when we will have to consider the competing pressures of all parties, the court, the litigant, and the counsel. Now, with regard to trial cases, in most jurisdictions, where jury trials had to be held, they did have a concern. Because the juries, as finders of fact, the, the argument is that juries, as finders of fact, when they sit together in a jury room, and when they decide, and more so in the US system where even for civil cases they have a jury, the predominant or the preponderance of the findings, the research that has been carried out in the recent past, the findings is that a group of people sitting together physically results has a particular result as opposed to seven people or 10 people sitting apart in their own different spaces. And therefore, whether the result, the final result, will be affected by not sitting physically together is something that is going to be a challenge. Then the second aspect is whether the grandeur and the, the system of law and the different place of the different participants in the court, the place of the judge, the place of the counsel, the place of the witness, whether when you change that entire scenario, whether the result eventually will be just, or whether the absence of the physical human being with each other, uh, with, with each other, and whether the presence of the human being with each other, the seeing, the looking at the parties in court, the actual person, the real, the real meeting, as opposed to the virtual meeting, and the consequences that flow from that, the advantages and the disadvantages of the human being not being in the same place when a decision is made. So some people feel that it is not going to result in that pure type of justice that they, that they conceive comes from a physical hearing. But having said that, in several cases of international arbitrations and international dispute resolution mechanisms, virtual hearings have become the norm across the board. But I think the challenge for the legal system of Sri Lanka, that's slightly outside the legal system that we are considering, the le for the legal system of Sri Lanka, the challenge is no doubt the allocation of resources and the allocation of personnel and skills and ensuring that the virtual court doesn't take away from the substance of what is delivered by the real court. So, so I, with great respect, I would like to say that the, where we in Sri Lanka are concerned, we have just passed recently our COVID Temporary Provisions Act. Whether it will have to be temporary or not is a matter that only time will tell. But whether we are then going to use this opportunity to triage cases and move certain cases completely into non physical hearings into virtual hearings is something that I think the policy think about. And in doing this whole thing, we are looking closely at the role of technology and how technology is going to assist us. 
I would think that the Indian Supreme Court, which has already got in place its e, uh, system going, which started before the pandemic, was a, in this part of the world, was able to get off fairly well because they have got this in place. And there is no doubt that we are at the foothills of a transformation of our court services. So the challenges would be to ensure that documentation reaches the parties on time, gets to the correct person within a reasonable time. Now, the studies reveal that in Singapore, for example, if a person were to ask a court to take up a case urgently, there is a minimum time of five days given. At that time, it was five days last year given so that the other side, the other party could present itself in court. And so I think each country is doing what is best and what works best for them. But the, there is no doubt that the challenges that we in Sri Lanka are facing are going to be common to all countries because the pandemic hit everybody in a common way. The only difference was that those countries which already had an e electronic filing system in place were able to grapple with it a bit easier. Not that there was a big difference, but they grappled with it easier and they moved forward quicker. And therefore, they opened up, their, they already had in place certain infrastructure which could help them to go forward. So whether we are going to do audio hearings completely or video hearings only or total paper hearings will depend on the change of the mindsets. Um, I would like to end by saying that there is no doubt that the legal environment, the environment, the physical environment in which legal proceedings are conducted does have an impact on how we perceive justice to be. When, you, when a person is in court, it is quite different from when a person is not in court, in reality. And the courtroom layout, as we know, reflects the relationship between the participants, the judge, the lawyers, the witnesses, the jury, the accused, the public. And there are times to get up, to sit, to stand, to bow. And this whole thing, this is the ecosystem of justice that we are used to. But how much of it are we willing to give up and how much of it are we not willing to give up is a matter that we will have to think seriously about. And the symbolism and the formality of the physical aspects of the courthouse combine to give us and show us the solemnity and the respect that we pay to justice as a legal process. But then it is clear that if we are going to move from this physical courthouse system to a virtual system, we will have to divide those cases that definitely need physical presence from those cases that do not need a physical presence of the parties or the litigators. And whilst bearing in mind that not everybody has access to digital resources. So with that in mind, uh, like what they did in Singapore, the courts created in the courthouses what they call the Zoom room and participants who were unable to have access, digital access to courthouses were able to come in there. So whether we in Sri Lanka will one day have to do that is something that our politicians will have to do that. No doubt there are several benefits of the virtual hearing, but with that one cannot run away with the idea that uh, there are absolutely no problems with it. And they are here to stay. There's no doubt the digital hearings are here to say, stay. But, and going virtual will open the door to complete integration of the legal teams and all the people that are engaged in the justice system. So I would like to close by saying that Touching, taking from what His Lordship the Chief Justice said and what our Minister of Justice said and what the Minister of Education also said, the distribution, of the giving of justice, dispensation of justice, dispensation of the administration is a fundamental matter that cannot be deviated from. And how we are going to do that in this pandemic, the challenge is, I believe to be ready for a mentally be ready for a change of mindset 
use digital technology in a way that is most beneficial to us without in any way compromising on the quality of justice and the access of the litigant to justice by making him know, having confidence in the system that there is transparency and the system is working for their benefit because ultimately dispensation of justice is for the litigant. He's, he's the He's the most important person in the whole process. So I would suggest, and I think that we are moving in the direction of exploiting the opportunities that information technology is giving us. Yeah, the modern system of courts and tribunals is getting transformed, but transformation and digitization are two different things. Transformation is transforming the legal system so that the, the procedure codes and the evidential rules change so as to permit litigation in those different modes to be accepted. And therefore, prioritization, collection and distribution of resources, I think, would be the challenge for us. And I see the pandemic as an opportunity to do things previously that were not thought possible by using technology. And I think a couple of years from now, maybe we won't be around, but a couple of years from now, looking back, the greatest legacy of this pandemic may well be the decentering and the displacement of litigation as we know it, with lawyers and human, people, human beings pleading before another set of human beings for their cases in a particular way. The question judges, lawyers, rulemakers, and legislators, and all of us should be now asking is not merely how whether we can safely open the courts, but also how the post-pandemic justice system will look different, and how different it is going to emerge when this thing is finally over. So as I see it, the challenge is to ensure that cases that are filed do not get unduly postponed, cases that need to be filed do not get blocked at the entrance and that the resources we have are used efficiently to the advantage of the system of dispensing justice. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Jamil, for taking us through that whole gamut of the administration of justice system. And uh, so it is interesting to note that you specifically recognized the importance of the transformation that is required in adopt, adapting ourselves to the new system. And also your emphasis on looking at it in a holistic approach is well thought of. And you went to the extent of making it and distinguish between the trial process and the appellate process and what different challenges are to be faced by the same legal system in dispensing justice in those two different areas. So it was very thought provoking and also very beneficial to fathom as to how we are to adapt ourselves and what changes are we to bring in. Because the distinction that you made or what you tried to recognize between the service and the place of delivery of service and which is to be given priority over the other is a matter that certainly we all will have to think about and see how best that we can ensure the ultimate goal of delivery of justice is not impeded unfairly or unreasonably through this process. So thank you again for that wonderful presentation. And now I have the privilege to invite as the next speaker to discuss on revival of a past decision to meet challenges to our legal education in the new normal. As we all know, the legal education plays a prominent role or one of the cornerstones of any successful legal system. And the next speaker 
who has immense experience in the academic field, who had served as the principal of the Sri Lanka Law College for nearly a decade, and who holds a LLB degree and a LLM degree from the University of Colombo and a doctorate from St. George University, an attorney at law that who had been in practice from the year 1978. So the 40 years of experience that he has in legal education, he would explain us and he would enlighten us on the impact that has on the legal education and what avenues that we have in meeting those challenges. His position as the Vice President of the Commonwealth Legal Education Association exemplifies the important role that he had over the period had played in the area of legal education. So may I now invite Dr. Joe Silva, the former principal of the Sri Lanka Law College to address this gathering. Good afternoon, everybody. Your Lordship, Chief Justice Jayanta Jayasuriya, President's Council, Honorable Ali Sabri, President Council, Minister of Justice, Honorable Susil Premajayanta, State Minister for Education Reforms, Open Universities, and Distance Learning Promotion, Mrs. Farsana Jamil, President's Council, Senior Additional Solicitor General, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I wish to thank Major General MP Piris, Vice Chancellor, Mr. Mangala Vijayasinghe, Dean, and the Faculty of Law of the Kutalawala Defense, Defense University for the invitation extended to me to make a presentation at this prestigious conference. I consider it a great honor to be in the presence of such a distinguished audience. On a personal note, I would have been very happy if I were able to be there personally. But you know, I am unable to do so due to various constraints now present in the new normal. It is with a sense of nostalgia that I speak today as my house is just a few minutes away and two roads across from the KDU. It is not the same old Kandavala Mahavata now that was there about 30 years ago. The KDU has completely changed the scenario with magnificent buildings, a beautiful lake surrounded by a walking track making a pleasant environment. More than anything else, KDU has made a name for itself as one of the leading higher education institutions with a reputation for academic excellence, for outstanding as a beacon, as a hope for higher education in the country. Congratulations, Kutalavala Defense University. Now, reverting to the main topic, the main theme of the conference is security, stability, and national development in the new normal. <clears throat> it is an undisputed fact that the legal profession plays a vital role in those aspects in national development. And the foundation is laid in law school for a vibrant legal profession. The topic, topic of my discussion today is on reviving a decision from the past to meet challenges to our legal education in the new normal. In order to make a logical presentation related to this theme, I embarked on a research on, for an authoritative definition of the term new normal and found none in the lexicons. Most dictionaries had uh, entries on normal but not normal. Normal has been described as typical, usual, ordinary, what you expect 
<coughs> or a way of behaving that is usual or expected. However, I found many explanations of this term in a number of other sources. One writer, for example, attempted to, attempted to explain it with reference to old normal and new normal. Old normal is the situation that existed prior to and the new normal after some event, calamity or disaster. Dr. Jennifer Ashton, in the book titled New Normal, that she co-authored with Sarah Tolan, says, within quotes, the asteroid has hit and it has ushered in a whole new era. And with the pandemic era, what we do, how we think, what we fear, and what we believe in are all drastically different and will be the same for years to come. She goes on to say that the people will think twice before being in crowded places, uh, <clears throat> won't be eager to hug and handshake, and sanitizing stations will continue to exist. Some will continue to wear masks, keep social distancing. She adds, within quotes, the pandemic has been tragic, terrifying, and disruptive enough that all, all have a touch of PTSD, that is post-traumatic stress disorder. The, uh, within inverted co uh, within quotes, the asteroid that hit our planet is a virus called COVID-19. On 13th, on 11th, sorry, on 11th March 2020, WHO declared it as a pandemic. The world braced itself for the impact with lockdowns, travel restrictions. Economies came to a halt. Millions of Billions got infected and many died. Job losses, bankruptcies followed. Mask wearing, social distancing, sanit sanitizers, quarantine, and self-isolations became common. Cases of anxiety, depression, mental <clears throat> illness began to rise. Vaccines came in to be administered on a massive scale. As <clears throat> As the asteroid has hit the planet, a new environment has emerged, and if any species is unable to adapt themselves to the new environment, they will vanish like the dodo who became extinct due to the loss of habitat and losing the competition to other animals that evolved. Thus, COVID-19 has impacted practically on every aspect of our lives. In this pre presentation, however, I will focus on information technology that has come to the forefront uh, to fill the gap created by restrictions on social gatherings and interactions. Consequently, online shopping, video conferencing, Zoom meetings, webinars have become the order of the day. Now, have, have the profession and their clients, re, how have the profession and the clients reacted to this situation? Clients seek legal services to avoid disputes and to resolve disputes. They are not concerned with the mode of delivery of service, but want speedy, <coughs> efficient, and easily accessible service despite the change of the environment. Legal profession, on the other hand, has been conservative, <coughs> slow to change, and always behind social change. However, they have now come to realize that unless they adopt themselves, adopt innovative methods, they will lose to other animals competing for a share in the market, such as accountants. Richard Suskind, a solicitor in Lung London who has written a number of books on law and technology. And his first book in 1996, 
was the future of law. He said in that book that email would one day be the main means of communication between lawyers and their clients. You'd be surprised to know <coughs> the response, response of the Law Society of England and Wales. They declared that he was bringing the profession into disrepute and banned him from public speaking. In this book, he further predicted within courts, we are in the brink of a shift in legal paradigm, a revolution, a revolution in law, after which many of the current features of contemporary legal systems, which we now take for granted, will be displaced by a new set of underlying premises and <coughs> presumptions. Much of the law will be radically different. Close quotes, page 41 of the book. His prediction was frowned upon at that time. Nevertheless, it has now become a reality with the pandemic. The asteroid that hit the planet has now changed the mindset of the lawyers and the judges. The Supreme Court of Justice is the highest court in the United Kingdom. It replaced the House of Lords, which has been the bastion of tradition and conservatism. The highest court has now changed. Lord Jones Jones, Justice of Supreme Court in the UK, in a recent discussion with in, uh, the Institute of, Institute of Advanced Legal Studies in London explained that the Supreme Court judges now work from home. The cases are heard online. The proceedings are live streamed so that the general public can watch them as if they were present in the court. All court documents are digitized and the lawyers file appeals and relevant material in electronic form too. He says that is a, it has many advantages. It is easier now to locate relevant information as the, the press of a computer button. Instead of turning pages in the bundle, bundles, he adds that the change has been possible due to excellent support they receive from IT experts. He predicts that even if, it's in, if some form of normalcy returns, the practice of using digital bundles, video conferencing, etc., would continue. They have also found the advantage of online hearings for the Privy Council. The appeals come from faraway places of the Commonwealth. The council can now address court from their own countries without traveling all the way to the United Kingdom. It is much easier to get them together online. I have recently listened to some webinars by IT savvy young Sri Lankan lawyers who are very enthusiastic about the new developments and the <clears throat> advantages of providing easily accessible legal services without undue delays. If these are going to be the future, is the legal education in Sri Lanka equipped to face the challenge to produce lawyers capable of working in the new environment? Since most of the teaching in the future is going to be online due to restrictions on social interactions, modalities of teaching, learning, and assessment have undergone a radical change. Virtual learning environment have been created to give a feeling of real-time teaching and interactions between teachers and students, and also among students with one another. If one looked at the websites of foreign universities, one could observe how they have responded to the COVID situation. These sites allow teachers to upload or link to various resources such as like e-libraries and documents, videos, etc. They have facilities for setting up forums and a number of interactive features. The academic staff for the Sri Lanka Law College have done their best 
to teach online <clears throat> using whatever facilities available to them. Although this is an admirable step forward, one has to go further and create a, create a comprehensive virtual learning environment. Sarah Halwell, the head of the academic work of Lexis Nexis, begin on the impact of COVID on legal profession and legal education, says that the need of the hour is to focus on inventing, investing in technologies and systems that to <clears throat> affect those used in the legal environment, that reflects those used in the legal environment. It would increase the employability of law graduates. Law firms look for people who know how to work in the new environment. They do not wish to waste their time and resources in training law graduates again. Sri Lankan universities and the KDU have the resources such as IT experts and senior academics to design delivery of academic services and conduct assignments online. Plus, they have funds from the state. On the other hand, Sri Lanka Law College has to depend uh, mainly on part-time lecturers who rush from courtrooms court to the college to deliver lectures. They have no time to engage in research or training to design lectures and assignments to, to uh, suit the modern modes of delivery. Neither does the college have the finances to invest on equipment and obtain services of experts. Perhaps not many are aware that the college is not funded by the state or any other source. It has to depend slowly on the fees charge, which is hardly sufficient to meet even the routine expenses. Hence, the academic aspect should be handled by universities who have the capacity to radically change the content, mode of delivery, and assessment of subjects. In this exercise, artificial intelligence will play a dominant role in the subject, dominant role in this. <coughs> For example, it will not be the same old contract law. It will include online transactions, computers making offers and acceptance. St students should have some knowledge of technical tools to analyze data on contracts. Online dispute resolution mechanisms such as eBay, Amazon, etc. Similarly, criminal law will have a lot of content on crimes committed via IT. Cybercrime such as bullying, trolling, etc. Only the universities will have the facilities and expertise to research and develop content for such modules to suit the local environment. Law college would therefore focus solely on practical aspects for which they are best suited and play a role similar to that of the Bar Council and the Law Society in the UK. In fact, a similar proposal had been made nearly 100 years ago some may argue we had our legal education at the law college, and some of us are at the top of the profession today. Why, the, why then change this role now? It is because the asteroid has hit the profession hard, and in order to survive, the college has to allow university to do academic subjects and college to focus solely on practical training. It appears Sri Lanka is the only country in the Commonwealth where a person can be a lawyer without a university degree. Today, there are a number of universities and institutes of higher learning providing courses for LLB qualification. Unlike some years ago, there are ample opportunities now to obtain this qualification. It is a waste of limited resources to duplicate teaching of academic subjects in the universities and the, and the law college. At the time the college was started over 100 years ago, 
there were no universities in the country offering courses in law. The original intention was to hand over the teaching of academic subjects to the University of Ceylon once it was set up. Let us recall what is on the website of the law faculty of the University of Colombo, referring to the history of the legal education within courts. The next stage of the evolution of the legal education in Ceylon was initiated in 1923 by Chief Justice Sir Anton Bertram, who pointed out grave defects in the education provided by the Ceylon Law College. He appears to have realized the limitations of the large vocational training given by part-time teachers at the college and to have had in mind the broader objectives which a university teachers are expected to follow and the wider horizons they can open to the students in the environment of a university. His suggestion with the Council of Legal Education accepted in 1924 was that the major part of the instructions of the law students be transferred to the Faculty of Law at the proposed University of Ceylon, leaving the law college to provide a postgraduate course of instructions what were termed practical subjects. But 11 years later, the council went back on its earlier decision. <coughs> Professor Nataraja, Convocation Address, University of Colombo, close quotes. I hope the delegates in these sessions will focus on how the universities would adapt to the new habitat and introduce curricula with artificial intelligence content. Sri Lanka Law College, which has hitherto done an immeasurable service to the legal education and legal provision, could devote to the provision of a meaningful and effective practical training, which is, a most which is of most importance to make a good professional, and leave the teaching of academic subjects to the universities. Hence, I commend to the delegates to consider this proposal at their deliberations. One might ask the question, what could we do now when the Council of Legal Education lost this opportunity to implement it when they had all the powers at that time without the constraints the Council faces today? May I respond, may I respond with the words of Sundar Pichai, CEO of Google, to a graduation class in 2020? Quotes. History will remember you for not what you have lost, but you have gained. I'm optimistic you will, close quotes. I congratulate, congratulate the vice chancellor, the dean and the faculty for organizing this conference and wish the delegates a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joe Silva for taking us through the early days, legal education, what existed, and the importance of making the distinction between the academic studies and the professional studies that needs to be identified to strengthen the professional aspects of becoming a lawyer. And also you identified the, as to what is new normal, and what is normal and how it would become new normal. So it is interesting to note that the challenges that are faced in transforming the legal education, even the challenges that existed prior to the pandemic situation have now perhaps aggravated the difficulties that have to be faced by both the academia as well as the law students when they are to take over the legal studies. The most important factor that you recognize is the, the law school or the law college should now be geared to ensure that we have the all necessary facilities to produce a lawyer that who is in a position to take up the, the challenges in the future world. So thank you very much for taking us through all these. And the next speaker whom I have the responsibility in introducing you all 
is no stranger to the legal field. And uh, uh, one gentleman that who had had the rare privilege of serving the country in holding two important positions in the legal field, both as holding the office of the Attorney General and thereafter serving the Republic as the Chief Justice. And Mr. Mohan previous President's Council, who commenced his career in the Attorney General's Department as a State Council, then later on, who became the Attorney General and thereafter joined the judiciary, taking upon the highest challenge of holding the position of the Chief Justice. The Mr. Mohan Piris has had exposure in many different areas, even at the Harvard Law School, and then at the Center for Police and Criminal Justice Studies, the Jesus College, Cambridge, George Washington University, and the other important institutions. Currently, he is the permanent representative to the United Nations in New York representing Sri Lanka. So may I invite Honorable Mohan Piris, President's Council, to address this August gathering. His Lordship, uh, the Chief Justice, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, members of the faculty, members of academia, and most importantly, my dear students. I'm asked to speak to you today on uh, the court mechanism and what we can expect in the new normal. My dear students, our court systems currently face, in my view, three major challenges. Two of these arise as someone said, directly from the virus. And they are somewhat new to us. While the third is a perennial problem. The first challenge is to maintain, perhaps you will agree, a sufficient level of service while our traditional courts are closed or remain to be closed. Now, the extent of this challenge is unclear and would be different in different parts of the world. Now, an optimistic view is that we are, we have gone over the worst and normal service is surely but steadily being restored. However, a more realistic view is that the virus in one way or another will be with us for many more months and possibly years. So the most significant problem here, therefore, is that we do not yet have alternative methods for handling some kinds of court hearing, such as those relating to serious crimes. Because you know that serious crimes deal, can surely end up in the deprivation of one's liberty, which is something which is treated as being sacrosanct. The third challenge is, a, as I said, a perennial one and flows from an alarming, perhaps unpalatable truth. And that is that even in justice systems that we regard as the most advanced, dispute resolution in public courts generally take too long, cost too much, and the process cannot be understood by anyone except for the lawyers lawyers are quite happy with whatever the system is. Now, in the most general terms, we call this, uh, within courts, access to justice, a problem connected with the access to justice. I will deal with it a little later on. We can choose to blame the widespread reduction in public legal funding. We can argue that the current judicial and court machinery is disproportionate in many cases. We can claim that sometimes lawyers are the problem because they can inflame disputes. We can regret how little data is available to help us even to understand the problem. We can condemn the system for being 
old fashioned, arcane, and perhaps antiquated. But whatever the explanation is preferred, the reality of it is that most people cannot afford to enforce their legal entitlements in our courts. My dear friends, you can take it from me, globally the statistics are pretty bleak. I've seen it in the UN. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, only 46% of human beings on, on this planet live under the protection of the law. So, quite frankly, we in the legal community uh, should not be too proud of ourselves. There is much that we can be proud of in our law and legal institutions. It should be our industry, our commitment, impartiality, our probity, but we cannot allow vanity to perhaps occlude our view of how distant the courts are from the people. My dear students, I'm not too sure as to whether even the pandemic has sensitized the legal system that it has to change. If it was to deal with contemporary challenges more efficiently and build back the legal system better. There is a new normal in our courts as they start hearings across the country with more technology, new rules of operation, and large caseloads, perhaps, or case records to get through. The usual scene of the crowded corridors filled with people anxiously waiting for their case to be called have now been, perhaps, and will soon be replaced with virtual meeting rooms, or can be replaced with virtual meeting rooms large binders, files, and bags of court paper are now digital documents in folders and in online filings. But it is not clear, and what is not clear, is whether this new normal will be a good one or a harmful one for the thousands of people who must go to court to deal with criminal cases, a simple bail application civil cases, matrimonial causes, or commercial problems. So, His Lordship will agree with me that as we open up, we will be confronted with an important question, and that is to decide if this new version of the justice system will bend more towards or farther from equity and equal access to justice for my dear students, in the past years, our courts have been engaged in new things. But the pandemic has accelerated the court's willingness to adopt to technology that can make the court more efficient and possibly to make access to justice and equity more of a priority in the justice system. Now, the court's new normal has two other important factors that I want you to appreciate. These are factors beyond the need for social distancing, beyond the need of wearing masks, and beyond the need of the requirement to use remote technology. Firstly, there is likely to be a, a surge of new lawsuits coming into our courts. Think about it. Growing out of the financial crisis that the pandemic has produced, now, that must be a foreseeable consequence as people have lost financial security. This is likely to show up in overwhelming records of perhaps cases of foreclosures, evictions, money actions, debt recoveries, recoveries of vehicles, mortgage bond cases, and a complete cocktail of cases that will be filed in our courts. I, I say, then I predict a massive surge. How would the courts then, I ask the question, intend dealing with that increase? The courts then are going to need, in my view, new strategies to deal with this increase and to protect the rights of people whose housing, finances, and family life could be seriously compromised by these 
cases. My dear students, the other factor is an increasing awareness by the judiciary of the justice system's role in the country's issues of dealing with a pandemic that has compromised their rights. Now, you will remember that even before the pandemic, one of the common complaints by most litigants was that access to justice was not easy. Now, let's, let me explain just what I mean by access to justice. It is not simply the inability to get adequate legal assistance to deal with legal issues and litigation. It is the sheer frustration of having to go through an unusually long waiting period for justice and the inevitable financial constraints they cause in the pursuit for justice. Now, access to justice simply would also include the complaint that the law was not clear. Think about it. How many laws are very clear? That the laws are not predictable. They are not consistent in their application. The laws are not, cannot be easily understood. Isn't that so? Is it the case that we write our laws in a way that ordinary people don't understand them? That cannot be the case, isn't it? Laws are of the people and for the people. Now, this has been further exacerbated by the wake of the recent wave of the pandemic. Now, the judiciary, having recognized this phenomenon, are also grappling with their own role in propagating and upholding justice that facilitates the life of the community. It is heartening to note that the judiciary is also open to change. But my dear students, the million dollar question is what will this newly changed judicial system look like? And more importantly, the question is, will it be harmful to the thousands of people who are at risk of losing their livelihoods and face financial devastation as they are brought to a court by landlords, banks, financial institutions, debt collectors, and corrupt law enforcement officials. On one level, you will appreciate that technology changes happening in the new normal are rather exciting. We're all excited with our devices. We are working from home. Ostensibly with their promise of reducing the burden of coming to court and defending oneself. Think about it. Through our experience with legal design, globally, universally, and access to justice, we have had many discussions with all the stakeholders for so many years, and I'm fairly sure his lordship does it on a daily basis. Interviewing people, talking to people, coming to courts, asking them for a feedback on their, how they deal with their traffic offenses, a simple case like that, divorces, maintenance applications, custody applications, or tenancy problems. Again and again, we have heard just how it is to get there. That's a perennial complaint. The disruption of their homes. They have got to leave their homes, transport themselves to a court, and probably run the risk of the home being ransacked when they get back. Transportation to a courthouse leave from work, days off from work that has to be arranged. Reluctant employers who don't want to give leave. So a technology-driven court system may make it easier to show up to crucial court hearings, make obtuse court processors more navigable, easy to manage, and empower more people to take full advantage of their legal protections. However, we must appreciate that there is a substantial risk that this new normal could worsen people's access to the justice system. Now, this might alarm you. Why I say that is especially if they are on the wrong side of the digital divide. In other words, how many of them have access to digital devices, to the internet, to Wi-Fi, to the infrastructure? In other words, they are on the wrong side of the digital divide. Now, reports have highlighted how some courts are considering digital bail applications of suspects in custody. And all those who haven't managed to make their online 
make it to their online hearing with the potential, what is the potential of being handed down a default judgment against them? Have you thought about it? How do we deal with it? How do you do, how do you purge your default? So even when a person does appear at a remote hearing, and remote hearings, as you know, go by quickly and without guidance on how to raise defenses, show evidence to get one's story across, might cause us problems. So we need to cater to those contingencies. Let's leave the room for the possibility of a lawyer, for example, who may not be so competent in adopting to a digital environment. Don't bless lawyers with some kind of magic that they probably would not have of adopting to a digital environment. A judge too can suffer from the same incapacity. Let's not make a mistake about it. As, as courts go more technologically based, these early reports of access issues may become more common, especially for people who don't have strong internet connections, video resourced repeat players, video friendly devices or expertise in online meetings. So well rehearsed, well resourced, perhaps repeat players in the court, like plaintiffs and their lawyers will quickly become experts in remote hearings and be able to speak more, present evidence correctly, bring witnesses to testify and get to favorable outcomes. Of course, you know that in international arbitration today, we have fine tuned it to an art and that perhaps is some, uh, perhaps an example that we can look at to study and adopt some of those procedures that we very effectively uh, adopt. Right at the moment, uh, there is an arbitration that's going on where the arbitrators are in three parts of the world and the parties are in two different parts of the world. Now all these crucial legal tasks are hard enough to do in person. And my view is that it may be even more intimidating for a person without a lawyer to do when they are suddenly engaged with an online court hearing. So it is therefore important my dear students to appreciate that it is now a crucial time for the courts to appreciate that the new normal needs to be defined, not just around efficient technology, but around equity and access to justice. Now that means including more diverse communities in defining how these seemingly technocratic decisions of remote hearing procedures are set up. Now these procedural details and design choices have perhaps significant effects on the lives of people and financial stability. And it is crucial, I say, to experiment with how to design remote courts in ways that are accessible, in ways that are empowering, and in ways that are equitable. I believe that to do this, the legal system needs to engage with people beyond the experts and learn from users, experiences and ideas to design a court system that works not just for the convenience of lawyers and judges, but for anyone who invokes the protection of the law. My dear students, we must also gather data about the new normal of the courts. In other words, what I mean is for equity and access. Courts and researchers must track whether remote hearings result in more people missing their court dates, <coughs> losing their cases, or not being able to speak as much as the other party. They should be tracked with attention to different ethnic groups, with people who speak Sinhalese, who speak Tamil, who speak English as their first language and perhaps, and not to forget, people with disabilities. <clears throat> now this pandemic, you will appreciate, has forced change upon a court system that has been resistant for decades. Now is the time, I say, for courts to define a civil justice system that is designed thoughtfully, inclusively, and with equity at its center. I hope I have left you with enough ideas to think about and ponder upon. And I hope that it would contribute in no small measure to the legal system and the judiciary in putting in place 
a system of law, perhaps a hybrid system of law, that would be a good combination of our old system with the new online system. I wish you good luck in your studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Mohan Peiris, for that discourse. You managed to emphasize and re-emphasize the importance of not only meeting the challenges of the pandemic, but also addressing the perennial problems that had been there in the system and further challenges that are to be met in trying to address these issues in a pandemic situation. And the importance of placing in forefront the access and equity as most important factors in gauging the success or failure of the changes that we are to adopt in meeting with the challenges that we are facing due to pandemic. I think those views certainly give a lot of material to think upon to all of us who are trying our best to come out of this situation. And as I said at the beginning, to ensure the service that we render to the people would be to the utmost benefit of those people that who seek justice from the court system. So with that presentation, I think we come to the end of today's presentations. And according to the agenda, of course, there is a room for questions and answer session, but I think we are very far behind the time schedule. So therefore, we may not be in a position to have a question and answer session. And also, as a summary, at the end of each if speaker, I expressed my views and also highlighted the important area of those different presentations. So therefore, I do not intend taking much time in making a summary of the whole proceedings today, but I wish to thank all the speakers that who took time to think about the situation that we are faced with today and the need to devise different mechanisms to overcome these challenges and more particularly the, the opportunity that we have got in this situation to make it a challenge, not only a challenge, but an opportunity to bring in changes to further improve the ultimate system that we are to deliver to the public. So with those remarks, I would conclude these proceedings, the presentations. Again, I would thank the Vice Chancellor and the Dean Faculty of Law for inviting me to uh, chair this session. It is very thought-provoking and I'm thankful to all the speakers for their well-researched, well-thought-of presentations that would certainly leave many thoughts and us to consider what more that we can do in these difficult times. So may I conclude the session and then hand over the floor to the Dean of the Faculty of Law Dr. Mangala, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much to the Honorable Chairperson, His Lordship, the Chief Justice, and the esteemed panel of speakers for your valuable insight and enriching speeches. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has now come for the launch of the KDU Law Journal, Volume 1, Issue 2 published by the Faculty of Law, KDU. KDU Law Journal seeks to fulfill the long-felt lacuna created by a lack of research publications in the field of law. It is a peer-reviewed biannual publication which provides a platform and an opportunity to both local and international researchers to disseminate legal knowledge. I respectfully invite the Vice Chancellor of KDU, Major General Milinda Piris, RWP, RSP, VSV, USP, NDC, PSC, accompanied by the head of the department, Ms. Kalyani Jayasekara, 
to launch this prestigious publication. Thank you, sir. Now I respectfully invite the Dean of the Faculty of Law to present a hard copy of the journal to the Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, sir. Now I respectfully invite the Dean of the Faculty of Law to present a hard copy of the journal to the Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much, sirs. Now we are going to commence the evaluation of the poster presentations. In the poster presentation session, five researchers will present their research outcomes in poster mode, while the honorable panel of judges, consisting of our esteemed plenary speakers, will evaluate their presentations. Dear presenters, please note that the time limit for the presentations will be three minutes, and we will be ringing a bell at three minutes. To commence the evaluation session, I invite M. Karnanathan and F. A. M. Imtiaz for their poster presentation. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the People's Bank of China banned cryptocurrency exchanges in 2017. But all of this changed with Chinese President Xi Jinping's statement about the importance of blockchain and the need to accelerate the development of the technology in China. Our paper today is based on this technology, a need of blockchain law in a cryptocurrency-based future, potential and possibility of a purely blockchain entity. This paper aims to analyze blockchain technology and examine the need, uh, the need for blockchain law because despite its growing popularity among businesses and consumers, blockchain is still relatively new in terms of legislation. Block, legislation. Blockchain technology can create a ledger for any type of record. Blockchain technology also plays a prominent role in the existence of cryptocurrency. In the internet era, data is expected to become the third major production factor after labor and capital. The role that the next generation of blockchains may play in the emerging data-driven society is immense. But this blockchain has been called a haven for criminal activity because blockchain currencies have been widely used in money laundering and drug trafficking. So we know that blockchain has ignited the flame of cyber libertarianism. In that case, if we have a conversation regarding blockchain and law, it can be framed in two ways. Is it possible to have legal oversight of these technologies, or should they in fact be? Surprisingly, one option blockchain to establish more robust confidence is through judicial system. Thus, sovereign states all over the world are debating how to regulate the blockchain inevitably, focusing on this interse intercession as a legal issue. The nature of the blockchain, on the other hand, makes it difficult to apply traditional business law as there are some main con smart contract restrictions which are still unaddressed in the current state of the technology. However, Bill Gates said future of money is digital currency. The adoption of blockchain, cryptocurrency, and virtual assets is rapidly increasing. 92% of the 154 countries studied had cryptocurrency activity. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I hope we have convinced you that sovereign state all over the world should regulate the blockchain and there should be an exclusive controlling power. Thank you. is Hansita for the host of presentation. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm DPDN Kularatna, a final year student from Open University Sri Lanka. Uh, my topic is a comparative literature review of the contribution of transgender rights in the legal context of India and Sri Lanka. Uh, firstly, I would like to go through my abstract. Discrimination against any condition that a person acquires on their birth goes beyond the criteria of equality. As we all know, society has long created different social conditions for these two parties based on gender difference that has been biologically available to both men and, men and women. So transgender people have identities different from the gender that corresponds to sex organs determined at birth. Has the Indian and Sri Lankan legal context contributed adequately to establishing transgender social rights within their legal system? In comparison, transgender people have a stronger historical presence in India than in Sri Lanka. It can also be seen that the international legal context of transgender rights makes positive contribution to gender orientation and gender identity. The legitimacy of American realism, sociological and natural law schools can also emphasize the legitimacy of securing transitional society, transitional social rights. Accordingly, the statutory authorities and the Sri Lanka community should contribute to the expeditious preparation of legal provisions to develop transgender social rights while upholding the Indian legal position. So, I would like to go to my introduction. The definition of humanity must be based on justice and fairness, as we all know, because the discrimination that any individual acquires based on any condition he or she acquires at birth transcends that cri the criteria for equality in humanity. So, uh, quickly, I would like to go to my methodology. To analyze the contribution of transgender rights in the legal context of India and Sri Lanka, the study has used eight main variables in addition, constitutional security, legal security for confirmation and recognition, statutory legal security, legal security for the promotion of social status, legal recognition as the third gender, right to education and right to marriage are used as the independent variables. As we all know, here it shows, I, I would like to uh, show you the LGBTQ flag uh, as a, so and then, uh, I would like to the, I would like to go to my discussion part to ensure the government of Sri Lanka abides by its constitution and other legal documents, section 365, 365A and 399 of the penal code must be discriminalized under Sri Lankan law. In addition, the vagrant ordi ordinance should be removed and the government should then ensure that any person's real or perceived sexual orientation or gender will not be used to target and harass them and that if they are subject to such harassment, there should be a mechanism to place to make complaints and safety investigate. So then I would like to move to the results and analysis. In my research, I uh, I had I had compared the legal system of Sri Lanka and the India. Uh, so con finally, I can conclude that laws criminalizing transgender acts were imposed on Sri Lanka during the British Empire, and many similar laws in Britain and elsewhere have been repealed. 
Also, there is no evidence that homosexuality was a crime in this country before the colonial era. However, it is important to understand that transgender, which is not female or male in gender, is also a social construct. Therefore, it is important to provide awareness to eliminate transgender, bisexual or transgender phobia. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I invite BMP Banda Naika for their respective poster presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm Pranitha Banda Naika, a third year undergraduate from the Faculty of Law, University of Karabu, Sri Lanka. Let me share my screen first. The topic of my research paper is child-friendly justice and the best interest of the child, a comparative analysis of Sri Lanka, India, and international standards. It was expected to evaluate whether Sri Lanka has adequate measures to ensure the practicability of the best interest of the child in a child-friendly justice system. To seek answers for that question, to achieve the following research objectives, namely to evaluate the legislative framework of child-friendly justice in Sri Lanka, to compare the juvenile justice systems in Sri Lanka and India, and finally, to appraise the adequateness of the existing legal framework of Sri Lanka regarding a child-friendly justice system. That the Sri Lanka does not have updated legislation regarding children. A major part of the main legislation about children, such as the Children's and Young Persons Ordinance Number no. 48 of 1939, is very dated. Therefore, to make the court process child-friendly, it is essential to bring in amendments to the existing procedural and substantive laws, or at least to make the court procedures more child-friendly and to introduce internationally accepted best practices concerning children who came in contact or conflict with law. However, it was found that the Children and Young Persons Ordinance have somewhat adequate measures in protecting the best interest of the child in a justice system. It provides for the establishment of a special juvenile courts, prohibits the publication of any reports of a proceeding before a juvenile court to protect the privacy of the child, and of course, directs the journal offenders to be kept separated from adult offenders. However, the practical situation is rather different. In many civil cases, especially in divorce, custody and maintenance cases, it is highly likely to see its children among the public in the normal courthouse. They are exposed to all the information that transpires in court. Furthermore, even though video recording of a child's interview is admissible under the evidence ordinance of Sri Lanka, Still, the child needs to be physically present at the courthouse to be cross-examined. However, the Journal Justice Care and Protection of Children Act and the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act of India provides rather strong right-based approach. Thus, it was concluded that theoretically, the Children and Young Persons Ordinance is some Thank you. Now I invite HLNS Chandrasiri for the respective poster presentation. Hello. 
see my presentation. Hope I think I am audible. Yes, thank you very much. I will present my practice with concise and dignity in accordance with good medical practice. These lines are taken from a medical professional oath. It's easy to take an oath, but it's at here it's difficult. Good evening, chairperson, ladies and gentlemen. Medical professions are considered as one of the honorable professions in Sri Lanka. But it is not justifiable to ignore if it is a negligent of the old view. Bowler's low body thought principle seeks into the stance of care and skill of a standard, reasonable, competent practitioner in ordinary degree. It's rare a case of medical negligence come up for adjudication in the courts of Sri Lanka. Fever proceed to trial and it's an exceptional situation it goes to final adjudication of a Supreme Court. Famous Piani Soisa versus Arsha Kularatna is just a tip of an iceberg and acts like recovery of damages of dead persons emerged even in 2019 it's an essential medical negligence reforms are still sinking under board. Simply and shortly, with these interests leads my objectives to comparatively analyze the compensation to protect the patient as a consumer. So I have followed qualitative research methodology and collected primary and secondary data through black letter approach. Then comparatively analyzed with the Indian American and New Zealand medical negligence methods with the empirical research method observe the clarity of difficulty in establishing the medical negligence litigation. On discussions, I have looked specially attention with the American professional insurances and New Zealand no fault system, the Indian Consumer Redress Forum with proactive judicial activisms. With those, I have recommended select one or use mixed method of collaboratively with the vigilance scrutiny to fill the gaps of prevailing Sri Lankan medical negligence compensation. As my search, I hope to spread to the betterment of innocent consumers as well as the good professional assemblies. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, I invite A.P. Vitanage for the poster presentation. I am sitting in 2019. No, this is 2021. How many goals have you achieved that you wanted to achieve by this year? Well, COVID-19 is reshaping the world from normal to new normal. Because the virus has dramatically punched the world in every aspect. Consequently, people have inspired to seek compensation through more creative, uncommon mechanisms such as public nuisance claims. My research is in the course of doctrinal methodology, intends to show the whether and what extent new appearance of public nuisance is applying in the scenario of COVID-19 pros and cons and defenses. Typically, public nuisance is an unreasonable use by a person of his or her property that works to injure the rights of the public. In the field of pandemic, it applies when the employer's failure to comply with COVID-19 safety guidelines in the workplace. To have think about what the new normal would look like, I have illustrated recent cases against Central Valley uh, Meat, McDonald's, Amazon, and Smithfield Foods, as this emerging moment is vastly adapted by United States of America. In Sri Lanka, five residents of Palmone have filed public nuisance case regarding COVID-19, 
public nuisance claim based upon employer's failure to heed public health orders may soon find itself in more com in employment cases, also in Sri Lanka, in the continuing nature of this crisis. These claims help to ensure workers' safety and actual victims can get a remedy. Ultimately, public health is protected. On the other hand, such claims could pose a serious threat as businesses seek to navigate the new normal, and such orders may cause to shut down businesses too. However, while some courts are giving wider interpretation to this doctrine, some courts have and defendants have avoided from it with the defenses. Implementing reasonable safety measures is an potential defense which can make the balance between competing interests of the employees and employers in the pandemic. Ultimately, the public health. Then the new normal may become a better normal, definitely a healthier normal where we'll be able to save work. Thank you. Thank you. This marks the conclusion of the post presentations and I once again extend my heartfelt gratitude to the panel of speakers of the plenary session in law for their valuable thoughts and for evaluating the post presentations. And thus ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of the plenary session in law. We hope to see many of you at the next year's conference and to officially conclude, please rise for the national anthem. Thank you so very much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Please enjoy the remainder of the conference.